from The Shadow to Zorro to Batman to The Invisible Man. For as long as there have been mysterious masked characters in mainstream film and television, there have been actors portraying them taking that mask off because it's better for their career if they're more recognizable in roles, and it's easier for an audience to emotionally connect with a character with an identifiable human face. Especially in the case of sci-fi, fantasy, and superhero characters. The eyes are the window to the soul, as they say, and it's no easy feat to perform with your eyes hidden and have that soul still on display. But I think after a long history of shafting characters in fiction with hidden features in favor of actor, vanity, or audience comprehension, I think we've come to the point where we can and need to accept that actors who can pull off a character in a mask are doing a better and far more complex job than those who can't. I can't feel the air. Sucks to be you. Because they're taking a bold extra step to improve the story or their character. Wearing a mask when it suits the story can build strong characters and inform really interesting and unique performances from actors. Looking back at those who succeeded, and those who were too afraid to try, there's an undeniable art to acting with no face. Special thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring and creative classes for anyone who loves learning. Invest yourself and your personal growth. Skillshare's classes are for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. These classes include a combination of video lessons and class projects. Have a specific skill you're trying to learn? Skillshare is the perfect place to start. I was interested in their film classes by teacher Matty Brown and had a blast watching him explain tips for creating visually appealing short indie films. The first thousand of my viewers to sign up using my special code, Godzilla Mendoza, or my link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Now back to the video. The mask problem is not an especially new one, and with the rise of mainstream cinema based on superhero comics, we've gotten a whole slew of characters with secret identities running around on screen telling their identity to just about anyone who will listen. And as time has gone on, these movies have put less and less emphasis on secret identities to the point that barely any characters have them anymore besides the obvious ones. Look at me, I'm an anonymous superhero that needs to protect his identity. Right until it would be a big emotional moment. Then you gotta see my face and all the emotions I'm having. And my Batman eye makeup will disappear between shots because I don't want to look silly. Oh no! The villain has forcibly removed the hero's face covering for their final encounter for maximum dramatic effect! The Spider-Man films are especially guilty of that one. Keep your mask on! Keep your mask on! Keep your mask on! KEEP YOUR MASK ON! Even with their villains shedding their symbiotic or helmeted visages as quickly or as often as they can to give an actor more screen time than the costume. Toby's Spider-Man twice over made the concession to heavily damage his mask to expose more facial features so you can see what he was feeling, which is at least reminiscent of all the times we got a teeth-gritting battle-damaged Spidey with the bottom half of his mask torn in the comics. But not once did this thing stay on or intact for the climax of a film. Maybe in this particular case it isn't so much actor vanity as it is the director thinking it's just more dramatic, but the point still stands that the mask gets tossed aside. One of the worst offenders of simply ditching a mask entirely for actor recognizability is Judge Dredd. The you know, Judge Dredd! The character conceals his face as part of his government mandated uniform as a symbol of his loss of humanity and individualism as he devoted his entire life and being to his career as a judge. Good ol' Sly Stallone wears it in the opening of the movie, gets kicked off the force, and never wears it again. Well, you know, until the ending where he rides off into the cyberpunk dystopia sunset. This sin was almost repeated with the near casting of Tom Cruise as Iron Man, who argued that they should give him a totally transparent faceplate so you could still tell it was him under there. Which would have, like, ruined the entire aesthetic of the costume. He doesn't look like a man made of iron anymore. Now he looks like Tom Cruise in a really tight metal spacesuit. He's gonna fucking pilot Gypsy Danger in that thing. However, the Iron Man films were able to make a reasonable compromise by showing an internal view of Tony's helmet so you can check in on Robert Downey Jr.'s Tony Stark in a heated moment of battle. But this clever method of having our helmet cake and eating it too inevitably became redundant when he upgraded to a foldable, transforming helmet 
that disappears and reappears entirely like Dead Space 2, or that thing the guy from Friends had in the 90s Lost in Space reboot. Bet you didn't think that would get mentioned in this video. And then everyone got one of those. Every member of the Avengers somehow independently developed the exact same disappearing helmet technology, making it astoundingly generic and unspecial. And thus begins the new stage, where Hollywood will begrudgingly include these elements of costumes, but make them as formless and easily removable as possible so they don't have to have the actors performing in them at length. Fuck Snake Eyes, this is the last shot of the movie. Fuck you, fuck yourself, you're shit. Fuck. Snake Eyes doesn't talk. Actually, I'm Henry Golding. Henry Golding? It's gotten to the point that practical helmets and masks on set became a bothersome hindrance, and so everyone is now just standing there naked from the neck up and miming button presses for the animators to figure out in post for turning into a transforming mechanism or nanomachines. Sun. For an industry so reliant on computer animation to do literally everything for them now so they don't have to plan ahead carefully anymore, you'd think they'd hold animation in higher regard. Because animated films make up some of our most formative movie experiences as kids. So many kids watch these movies over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Mm. But I digress. Even all three of the Spider-Man actors are now mostly wearing animated masks so they don't have to abruptly cut to another angle every time they remove said masks because none of the movies can be comfortable with him just tucking the mask into the neck. And so every unmasked Spider-Man suit is an entirely different costume from the masked ones, requiring the actors to change out entirely between shots. Just have him tuck it into the neck, it's fine, no one cares, Jesus. Oh, but you gotta have the face shell in there. It's gotta be this big plastic helmet. All of this is ultimately for the sake of convenience for the costume department having to no longer build comfortable and form-fitting headwear and actors not having to breathe through a layer of spandex or cold hard steel all day. And many actors don't necessarily want the hassle of having their most powerful acting tool taken away from them. An emotive face can be a really powerful driving force in creating a bond between the audience and a character. Tight close-ups build intimacy and familiarity. Removing that from an actor's toolbox makes their job much harder, which is just another reason voice actors deserve more respect and credibility for doing so much without being seen in any way. But let's keep that same energy going for body actors. This is not to say that no actor is brave enough to take on the daunting task of connecting with an audience while remaining mysterious and physically indescribable. Body actors do double the work for 5% of the credits. They're acting on hard mode. We're talking about the guys behind the mask, like the great Kevin Peter Hall, who had to make the Predator seem agile and mobile in the jungle while wearing pounds of rubber latex, armor, equipment, and a big animatronic monster head. But there was also a lot of thought into what kind of movement, what kind of... Uh planet he came from, the inner things that are going in, on in the character, just like as you would in any character, in the suit or out of the suit. That shit wasn't easy. There is a history of talented performers who worked through that fog to become memorable and lovable characters without an identifiable human face, and have portrayed characters that we see as frightening, authoritative, lovable, otherworldly yet somehow familiarly human, and even tragic and sinister. Star Wars is the only mainstream Western franchise that consistently boasts characters and masks that are impossible to remove. Be it because it's a life support system, a religious symbol, or their literal face because they're an alien or a robot. And for that I tip my helmet to the Lucasfilm for understanding that in spite of their lack of human and emotive faces, these are all extremely well developed and much beloved characters. Let's take it all the way back to Dave Prowse disappearing into his role. Darth Vader is such a dominating and intimidating presence. Prowse towered over every other actor on set, and his stone-solid, skull-like black mask gave him this almost demonic visage that just told everyone in the room not to fuck with that guy. When they did... We're giving you clairvoyance enough to find the rebel's hidden fort. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It didn't matter that we couldn't see Vader's face, it enhanced his character by further proving the point that he had lost his humanity and become a machine to serve the ideals of his fascist empire. He was frightening and powerful and closed off to us as an audience in a meaningful way. The helmet was his shackle to life and his master that treated him like a dog. And in his most character-defining moment in the original trilogy, 
We don't need to see his eyes or hear his voice to feel his conflict. Through that solid helmet, we could still see that this character was struggling with the decision of throwing his life's work away and betraying the man he swore an oath to, or letting his only son and the galaxy's only hope die before his eyes. People don't remember Darth Vader for the kindly old man that his Force Ghost appeared as. They remember the mask, and they felt a lot of emotions towards that mask. Dave Prowse's athletic build and talented body acting brought Vader to life as more than just a cool costume. The guy under it was cool too. And this was bolstered by James Earl Jones' talented voice acting, giving him a commanding and chilling voice. Commander, tear this ship apart until you found those plans and bring me the passengers. I want them alive! They could also be benevolent and tragic in the right moment. It is too late for me, son. These two actors made this character an icon and one of the greatest villains in cinema without being seen once. And all that work they did makes it all the more gut-wrenching when we say goodbye to Vader's character and see him unmasked for the first time. And you know what? Sometimes a mask doesn't need to cover your entire face to inform a character. Just enough of it that it starts to mean something. Judgment time. Carl Urban bit the futuristic smart bullet and wore his helmet for the entire filming of Dread, showing up even the great Stallone by bringing a more faithful adaptation of Joe Dread to the screen. All we see of him is this frowny mouth that just tells you that this guy is about to kick your ass and has had enough of whatever it is you're doing. And in an odd way, all he needed was his mouth alone to convey a lot of intensity in this character. You can always tell what he's feeling from these little micro changes in his expression, little twitches and shifts in the corners of his mouth to fill in the blanks left by his eyes and brow. But shielding the top half of Dredd's face gives him a sort of detached and robotic feel. You see enough to know he's human, but that visor is authoritative and emotionless, like a giant pair of aviator sunglasses. It commands respect and serves to make him more intimidating to the criminal element, while also, yes, showing that he's not just a man. His face is his devotion to his ideals and the system that governs this society. His face is everything he believes in. When you look at him, you know. I am the law. And that's a lot more interesting than if he was just Bones from Star Trek in a big puffy black vest now, isn't it? That character is a lot more unique now than the Stallone version bungling around with Rob Schneider as his comic relief. Bravo, Mr. Urban. Though, if we're being fair, Judge Dredd's helmet is really comfortable and easy to wear all day. It feels like sunglasses, basically. Yeah, I, I could just, I could leave this on, like, all the time. Not every masked character has to be intimidating, either. For some, it can be a way to make that character seem really noble and dignified, with their helmet signifying a strength and dedication to a cause, or just that they're really reserved. And the tension surrounding something as simple as a character never taking their helmet off can be really compelling. Like The Mandalorian. Some of the most exciting drama in the show comes from Din Djarin keeping his helmet on all the time. He only takes it off at the moment when it is absolutely the most dramatically interesting and impactful, and never a moment before. These long stretches of hours and hours of runtime without seeing him build to incredible emotional payoffs. Like for example, sharing an intimate bonding moment with a droid he once felt contempt and prejudice towards. This is character development happening. There's also the personally devastating moment when his face is seen by two humans for the first time ever while he is desperately trying to save his adopted son. He makes this major personal sacrifice that destroys his self-image and his standing within his own culture for the person he loves most. And this is a really unique and powerful moment that would have been completely undercut by allowing the audience to see him unmasked semi-frequently for dialogue scenes. A character with an inhuman face doesn't necessarily need to even be a mysterious tough guy hiding his emotions, either. A character like C-3PO is energetic, sarcastic, cowardly, and very emotional. His eyes are designed to always look a little surprised, and his body motions are jerky and quick. And in spite of his emotionless face, he's still a really iconic character that works perfectly as a comic relief and a foil to the tougher heroes surrounding him. His facial expression never changes, but he can still be a very friendly and inviting looking character with a lot of expression. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. A talented enough actor can even appear more than human through a mask. Kane Hodder's Jason Voorhees is menacing and terrifying. 
Without saying a single word of dialogue, his body language paints the picture of a malicious force of nature that is bursting at the seams with bloodlust. I thought when Jason is staring at someone and not moving, he looks like a mannequin. So I said, what can I do to still do that same stare but add life to the character? I came up with the, the breathing thing, so instead of this, you see this. And to me, that made it look like the character was about to spring any moment. Hodder's Jason Voorhees has such a specific movement. He doesn't feel robotic, but is still very driven and calculated in every decision behind his movement. He has this goal and he's locked into it for eternity. He shrugs off pain and agony while in pursuit of his revenge and you just can't help but wonder if this hulking beast really is just fucking unstoppable. The way it was written in the script was she makes the light start moving and it swings and hits me in the chest and I tumble down the stairs. I said, eh, that's not too bad, but how cool would it be if that thing just swings and hits me right in the face in the mask and then I just fall back like a tree and I go through the stairs. I think it's more in character of Jason. Tumbling down the stairs, I think kind of looks too human. You get so much without a single line of dialogue. Now that's impressive. When you have a real actor behind these prosthetics and, and, and makeup, it makes such a difference. You, you can tell when it's somebody just going through the motions and when it's a character. But say, what if your character is something otherworldly and quite unlike anything human at all? Masks that accentuate human features can be transformative and allow actors to play characters that don't resemble humans but are equally as expressive and full of life. Sometimes it's not just a helmet that can be difficult to act through, but a mask that becomes an entirely new face. Doug Jones has made a wonderful career out of using his unusually thin proportions to slide into the personas of fantastical and sometimes scary creatures. Every creature that he plays has a unique walk, body language, personality, and biology that he portrays while comfortably coated in hyper-realistic makeup and prosthetics that truly transform him into something, well, anything but a normal man. And even as alien as these characters are, he's able to play characters like Abe Sapien or the Amphibian Man as, like, friendly and lovable with their own identifiable ways of communicating emotions that are foreign to us, but still distinguishable enough to understand their inner thoughts. And not all masks are practical in the same sense. Andy Serkis and many other actors have given life to heroes and villains through a digital mask, capturing the movements of their body and face and then projecting that onto a beautifully rendered photorealistic animated character. Having to put yourself in the moment of your character in the reality of the story while in this uncomfortable suit and covered in dots is no easy accomplishment. And any thespian that can deliver a believable performance through it all should be given a lot of praise. I can't help but think about all these brilliantly acted characters and then think about the Halo TV show. In a post-Mandalorian world, something like this feels inexcusable because it goes so far against the core appeal of a character like Master Chief. Chief isn't initially a deep character in this game. Sleep well? No thanks to your driving, yes. His voice is monotone and non-distinct, but tough. His real name is generic, and he doesn't speak much because he's not meant to be a character at first. He's more of a humanoid vehicle for the player to experience this world and the story of this brutal science fantasy war between humanity and various alien races. But his lack of character becomes his character. He's a product of a military that kidnapped children and conditioned them to be warriors without emotion that will follow orders without question. And Chief being the strongest of them all, it stands to reason that he'd be the one with the least humanity. But throughout these games, we seem to develop a strong bond with his AI companion, Cortana, who in a sense is also a machine designed for war that wishes to be more than human. The two of them grow closer and become friends, and Master Chief allows himself to act out of emotion for her, and go against orders to protect her. Master Chief finds his humanity for Cortana because of his love for her. But apparently all that wasn't enough, and the producers at Paramount's live-action Halo series felt that this story arc just wouldn't work unless you could see the man under the mask. This is where the growing pains of translating that to a non-interactive medium come into play. It's one thing to connect with Chief while we control his every action and see through his eyes. In a sense, we're inside the helmet with him. But that doesn't gel with a television setting unless they film the whole thing like Hardcore Henry. 
we have to be outside the helmet now and watch his actions played out by someone else. And that creates an uncertainty with the strength of the character and the people producing the show. In fact, the series seems almost afraid to let him put the helmet on. After two straight episodes with it pretty much always off, they have this slow, dramatic shot of him putting on like, finally, Master Chief is here! And he instantly takes it off in the next scene. They didn't even make it like 20 straight seconds. Why do you need a shovel, Chief? Might as well use your helmet over there to dig. You're not using it for anything else. It's gotten to the point that they have to actively write excuses for him to put it on because it's such a non-entity. Can you show me what the house used to look like? I can interpolate and recreate a realistic facsimile of the environment inside your heads-up display. And they have so little faith in Pablo Schreiber's ability to act through the suit that they have not one, but two internal views of the helmet to keep tabs on him. It'd be less of an issue if this show wasn't so tell-don't-show in general. Just long, drawn-out dialogue scenes, no action, and characters spelling things out for the audience that we would be able to understand by just watching. Dr. Halsey designed everything to her specifications. When her creations behave in unexpected ways, she gets uncomfortable. To Dr. Halsey, human beings are messy. Irrational, chaotic. Halsey is different. She sees the world as a set of data to be optimized regardless of the short-term pain. Next to this level of dedication, the rest of us ultimately fall short. Like, yes, I, I know what her character is. You don't need to verbally explain it. I can see all that. Why, why are you telling me this after four episodes? I get it. The helmet issue in Halo is sort of emblematic of the show's problems as a whole. They took the easiest route possible for explaining the characters, and that included losing the iconography of Chief's armored face. The dialogue isn't subtle, the acting isn't subtle, nothing is subtle. And yet, somehow the show is really slow burn and downplayed and like, nothing is happening. Maybe it gets better later in the season, I, I don't know, I'll have to see, but so far it's just... Ugh. I feel like if I don't clarify, I'll be battling the comments about Halo forever. No, I don't think the show needs to be mindless, dumbed-down action and be exactly like the games, and I don't think the show is bad for trying to really establish its characters. I admire the effort, actually, but contrary to popular belief, slow pacing is not 100% tantamount to strong character development. Characters sitting around for 10 minute long scenes vocally describing their own backstories and each other's personalities isn't exciting pacing. Especially in a sci-fi action series about a super soldier fighting aliens. You can develop characters while also having action scenes in a series. And if you really know what you're doing, you can use the action scenes themselves to strengthen that character development instead of just stopping dead for mindless action for the sake of it. It's not this all-or-nothing mentality, so I don't want to hear anyone saying I'm being too hard on the show for being pretty dull. In trying to make Master Chief more relatable and human, they've alienated his biggest fans and created a version of him that they can't really connect with the same way. His lack of distinct physical appearance made us able to project ourselves into his mask and focus on his words and actions. It allowed us to empathize with him because we wanted to see a little of ourselves under that golden visor. To strip that away is to make him just another generic action hero space marine guy with a beard. And that's not to say Pablo Schreiber does a bad job, I think he plays this version of the character very well actually, but it's not the same character. If he was to take his helmet off at all, it should have been in a much later and more pivotal moment than gaining the trust of one civilian. I mean, I get what they were going for with this scene, but just too much too soon. It would have been challenging, but it wouldn't have been impossible, we've seen it before. A character with a helmet can and should work in a TV show. TV Master Chief's journey to being more human is lessened by making him more human to begin with. He has a lot less ground to cover than the character he was inspired by. Masks are worn by characters for reasons beyond just the practical. They can enhance characters, they can have meaning, they can transform them into something that can only exist in the world of fiction, and in some ways that can be just as identifiable and relatable as a human face. No matter who plays him, Spider-Man will always look like Spider-Man because that strange bug-eyed set of goggles inset to a spandex balaclava is expressive, relatable, lovable, and recognizable too. Some actors can play into this a little. Andrew Garfield in particular definitely seems comfortable in his mask. 
His body language and expressions project through his costume really well. But no matter what Peter Parker looks like under there, he's still a hero and an inspiration for a lot of people. He doesn't have to take the mask off for us to love him or understand him. And if he did it less, it would probably make the moments when he does a lot more special and impactful. Hell, just look at the new Batman where he wears his mask more often than he doesn't, and almost all of his acting is in his eyes alone. Robert Pattinson really nailed it here. I can't believe it took us this long for a Bruce Wayne to Batman ratio to flip, but I'm glad it happened. As we've seen time and time again, a character doesn't have to look like an attractive human Hollywood actor to be something audiences connect with. A strong performance can shine through because while humanity and personality are conveyed easiest through the human face, these can be conveyed just as efficiently through even the most subtle or most exaggerated movements of the body. Acting through a mask forces actors to think outside the box and try to be their characters in every molecule of their bodies, not just their expressions and words. Maybe it's time Hollywood let go of the limiting idea that a viewer can't find someone engaging unless they look just like you and me to be relatable and likable. It misses the power of fiction. They can look like anything. They can be anything. This isn't at all to say that showing a character's face for emotional connection and impact is wrong and needs to be abandoned. No, no, not that at all, but it doesn't have to be the only way. The human experience isn't just about facial expressions and looking good for the camera. With enough skill and understanding of their character, a performer can blast past that barrier and make us care about even the most emotionless and unfamiliar of faces. You know, Stan creates the outside and then I'm like the spark, you know, like the life that's inside. Without that, you know, you just have a suit.